Auburn's defensive front will make or break the Tigers' defense in 2023, but some of the things they're already doing in spring practice should get you excited. Freezing temperatures are likely for several hours inland and a few hours closer to the coast. Yes. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby. Thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Joining me as he does every single Monday, Lindsey Crosby, writer at AuburnDaily.com, also the host of Locked On MLB Prospects. And Lindsey, I mean, we've talked about every position group over the offseason for the Tigers a bunch. But just looking at the defensive front, I think it's going to make or break the defense in 2023. And we've talked about how the defensive backfield is solid, seems stable. The upside in that room is tremendous, but you need pressure and you need pass rush. And what's going to happen in the front seven is what is going to hopefully generate that. And so looking at the guys that are kind of battling for these top spots over the course of spring and look, I know Hugh Freeze talks about he's not going to assemble a depth chart which is fine. I believe him, but you still have to trot guys out first. There's still guys that are going to go out first uh, the, before uh, for the others. It's going to have to happen for a day as well. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. It's not final, sure, but still there is some sort of pecking order that has to be established at some point over spring. And so what we're seeing early with uh, Marcus Harris, Jason Jones, and Jeffrey Embaugh being that core three that we're consistently seeing throughout the first week of practice. Once again, cannot stress how early it is. But, Lindsay, we, we talked about this when Rod Roberts was hired as uh, Auburn's defensive coordinator coming from Baylor about a multiple system, seeing different defensive alignments along the offensive front, and we're seeing that early Already in the first week of practice, seeing that installed. And I think that is going to set up a lot of guys like Jason Jones, like Marcus Harris, like Jeffrey Emba, like the slew of transfer defensive linemen. I think it's going to set them up for success. Yeah. And the cool thing about the way that this roster sets up and the way that they've lined up on defense is you can kind of see how there's like three unique positions across the defensive line and how there's like the physical characteristics you're looking for, like Jason Jones, Justin Rogers, the transfer. Mm -hmm. They're both that incredibly big bodied wide base. I'm going to nose tackle. I'm going to take two yep. blockers on. I, I've got a guy on each arm and I'm still going to be able to throw somebody into a running back. Like sure. It's a very defined role and you can see how that works. The defensive um, a tackle job is a, is a different physical profile and it's somebody who's more like a traditional four, three nose tackle. Uh, defensive tackle as far as a guy who can he can shoot a gap he can do whatever needs to be done but same idea you want a little bit of a larger body and then you have the defensive end spot where it's a guy that maybe isn't as big but uh, has a little bit more speed and it's a distinct role from that tackle spot and I like the idea of having Jones Harris and Emba across the front because yeah. I feel like Jeffrey Emba's very athletic for his size. He's huge. He, he's huge, but he moves very, very well. Right. Marcus Harris is now a, an, an established veteran in college football. He's been in there for a couple of years now. And then Jason Jones as a large human being, uh, you know, it's a good way to get their skill sets on the field at the same time. Yeah. And then you can do a hockey style line change and just bring in the three transfers and Messiah and the silly kite Rogers and Johnson, just bring them in wholesale and get, close to the same level of production out of a whole different group of three guys. So it lets you rotate more and just have guys fresher. Yeah, I've said this before on the show. The only guy that I think is significantly better than every other defensive lineman on the roster is Marcus Harris. Can somebody else take that next step? Can Jeffrey Embaugh live up to what his potential could be when we were all super excited when he was like the number one Juco player in his class coming in and he had that big bro hug with, with Potato Man, like, we could see, I mean, the, the upside was there, right? And, and we'll see if they can put it all together. And we saw glimpses of it towards the end of last year. We saw glimpses of it. So there's a lot to like. But another thing that I was kind of intrigued with, because Auburn's defensive front has been pretty solid. I don't think it's been as great. And I think in some cases it may have actually underachieved to some extent, depending on what metrics you want to look at. But 
it's been because of the edge guys. And you could date, you could go all the way back to Carl Lawson, right? But as far as this era, uh, you know, with Brian Harson, it was Derek Hall is what made it really good. Ecuyona made it great at times when he was able to play the end of that first year than the start of this past season. But you could consistently have two of those guys on the field at the same time. They called one of them a rush and the other one a star, I believe was the terminology there. So now we're calling this, these Jack linebackers. But you only have four, Lindsay. You only currently have four on the roster. And so I was kind of, I was just kind of wondering, okay, well, with this multiple front, what would it look like to have both of them there? And after just, I, I think hypothetically, there's a solid, <laughs> I think there's a solid chance that we're going to see situations where there's two Jacks on the field at the same time. And I, I think you may see it with Elijah McAllister. It's probably going to be one of them just because he's one of the heavier guys in that room. And, the and most, experienced. Yep, 100%. And uh, also, I, I think he's got the size where he can be kind of a defensive end if you need him to be. A little on the light side, but I think he could do it. Um, if you're just asking him to rush the passer in that situation. But on the other side, like a Dylan Brooks, I think it makes a ton of sense. And so then you essentially have a five-man front because you still have those three down linemen. They're just uh, they're, they're just slanted in. And then you've got the two jacks uh, kind of being edge rushers that kind of keep contain and also rush the quarterback. I think you're also seeing this team in the first week run just three-man fronts. And I also think you're seeing a lot of four-man front with that fourth guy being a jack. And I think you're also seeing five-man fronts with potential of a jack on each side of the line. I, I think there's all kinds of um, fun things you could do with this. The fact that they're now going to do it. I think it's great. Yeah, and it, that's the cool thing about this defense is it feels like when you declare that you're multiple, it almost takes off, and they're, they're professionals. They're better at this than me, but it almost takes off that pressure of like, no, we're a three down lineman front. We always have to have three. You can mm -hmm. flex out to four. I can see scenarios where you have Jason Jones and Justin Rogers and Jeffrey Emba on the field at the same time. And you just have three incredibly large human beings. Say and those again. Put, Say those names again. Jason Jones, Justin Rogers, Jeffrey Emba as your three in the middle. And then you can throw a Marcus Harris on one end and um and a Elijah McAllister on the other. And that is that is a short yardage package that is mm -hmm, I can't maybe. do math in my head, but that is what 1,300 pounds of human being? It's a lot. I mean, it's just it gives you so much flexibility to mix and match. You can go yeah. four down linemen, and you can have some of your some of your larger jacks like a McAllister can flex inside. I could see a package where you have Keldrick Falk and Brooks on the outside, and you have a Marcus Harris and Elijah McAllister in the middle, and Wild. you have four pass rushing threats like a NASCAR package, as I think is what <laughs> some of the, some of the, the NFL teams used to call it. So mm. there's a, lots of options here, and. I think that the ability to make specific packages for specific situations and situational stuff is going to be something, an element that we haven't really had recently and is going to help this defense in those edge cases where this, this one yard or two yards is really important. Yeah. I think the idea of having two jacks on the field at the same time is great. I, I love all of it. I think it allows you to do a lot more things. And Roberts is all about dropping guys, right? Once again, I think there's a misconception, and I'll, I, I fell into this. When you talk about creepers, the defensive scheme of creepers, it's not just showing blitz and one of those guys is coming. It's actually the opposite. It's not showing blitz and one of those guys is coming and one of the traditional four guys on the line of scrimmage, an untraditional guy will drop back into coverage. Most of the time, it's the jack because his hand's not on the ground. It's easy, so you don't have to stand up and then backpedal back into position. So most of the time, it's a jack. And so you're not really limited in coverage. If you have two of those guys, you can still like you still as an offensive lineman, you still have to say, oh, this got new no, number 11 or number 39 could be coming. Yeah. And I want to go on the record now as saying some point in time in the 2023 season, provided that he's healthy, Jason Jones is going to drop back in a short zone and is going to get an interception. Oh my gosh. It's going to be, think about when, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago when you would watch the Steelers and the zone blitz and you'd see a, a nose tackle dropping back into the, you know, cover in the short middle of the field for a crossing route or something. And a quarterback would just throw it to him with no idea it was there because the quarterback's getting pressured off the edge by a nickel or something. You're going to see situations like that. And I'm calling it, I don't know if he'll be able to run it back for a touchdown, 
We always we always love a big man touchdown, but Jason Jones is going to get his hands on a ball when he's dropped back in coverage, and you're going to see that highlight video all over the internet for weeks. I'll cry if that happens. I'll we will cry. celebrate. We will celebrate on this show. We are big fans uh, of Jason Jones. Big fan. Big fan. Came on the show a few weeks ago. He's been working his tail off. Looks like he's leaned up a little bit. He's got a nice first step with what we were able to see a little bit in, uh, in practice last week. So I would love that. I would absolutely love that. All right, Lindsay. I talked to some folks close to the situation, and it sounds like it sounds like all three quarterbacks are getting equal reps. Let's discuss that in a moment right here on Locked on Auburn. Today's show brought to you by our friends at Built Bar. Lindsay, Built Bar is a big sponsor on your show as well. We both yep. understand the, uh, how great Built Bar can be. Look, you, you eat all of these different protein bars out there. None of them taste like a candy bar to the level of what Built Bar can offer. Specifically, I'm a big Built Puffs guy, um, but Lindsay, you have some of your favorite flavors as well. Churro is absolutely fantastic. Mm. I love churros as much as the women of San Antonio. Love a churro. Oh, that's that was okay. Got it. Yeah, and so they've got uh, they're all packed with protein, low in calories, low in sugar. So be sure to check them out, built.com. But also, if you don't want to order online, you want them now, you just can't wait. Head over to your local Walmart or Sam's Club, they have them there too. All right, Lindsay, it sounds like all three quarterbacks, and by just for clarification here, Robbie Ashford, TJ Finley, Holden Gurner, based on the folks I talked to, all three are getting pretty dang close to equal reps. They Like the folks that I talked to, they didn't like count them, but it all seemed pretty even. And it sounds like they're all dealing with similar things and it's accuracy. And I think there's a few things you can chalk this up to. Uh, I, I think one, it's a new system and you're throwing to guys and, it, and that are running different patterns than you may be used to. Um, I also think, you know, there's just questions about the accuracy <laughs> of, of all the quarterbacks in the room. I also think that's part of it as well. Um, but you know, it sounded like Robbie was the best in the first practice. And then, you know, I talked to somebody after the padded practice and it sounded like they were a little bit similar, but they also pointed out that Robbie's limited due to, uh, the nature of the style that he is as a quarterback, uh, obviously dual threat quarterbacks are going to be a little bit better because they can't use their feet in practice, right? They're, they're trying to simulate, you know, their arm. So, um, yeah, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on hearing that? So when you're talking about accuracy and things that would make a quarterback inaccurate, it's, in, it's important to separate, uh, like, physically being inaccurate because of your mechanics and what I call mental inaccuracy. So you, you, you wow. touched on this. You have a new scheme. You have guys running new routes. And usually when something like that happens, the biggest stumbling block is the verbiage. You're calling right. things different. Like it, this route has a different name. This combination has a different thing. This play has a different name. And so part of the inaccuracy for a younger quarterback, like an Ashford is, like an experience-wise Finley is, and then Gariner, is you're having to, until you have internalized that new playbook, you are still mentally translating the new play call into what you know it as from the old system. And so some of this is a little bit of processing delay where you're having to make sure that you understand exactly what is going to happen on the play that was called because you're having to translate it. And then to go along with that, then you have the mechanical issues that can cause someone to be inaccurate. Uh, so I would expect everybody to look a little less crisp than their potential because totally. of that because of that mental stuff, the real thing where you get worried is if you have an individual, like a one-on-one -on -one drill, and you know you you are throwing to a wide receiver, he is the only person in the route. You know what he is doing, and you're still inaccurate. That's a little bit different, and we just haven't had enough exposure in practice to these situations to know uh, how much of this is just some of the mental processing and how much of this is just this guy is inaccurate. Right. Right, and we'll see. We'll see. And look, I think that was kind of what um, what some of these quarterbacks were labeled with coming in the spring. You're not going to fix that in a week, right? So we'll see. We'll see if it's fixed throughout spring and then throughout summer. And you know what they do in the portal. Do do they go and get somebody else in the portal? We'll certainly have to wait and see. The offense has a lot of lateral stuff. 
as far as you know what we saw um, early in practice, or I guess what sources saw early in practice. And and that's a concept, and it's something where the last uh, group didn't really do a lot of this, but it's the the the, the concept is make the opposing defense cover every blade of grass. I love that the yards fifty three to and I think fifty three to half yards wide. Like mm-hmm. make them cover all 53. You can move guys out wide. Even if you just send a guy in motion from right to left. Right. If he is still in motion when the ball is snapped, that may pull a linebacker a little bit farther out, messes up a run fit, things like that. And so a lot of the top offenses in the NFL that you watch that are so good, whether it's like the Chiefs or the Rams with the exception of last year, things like that, mm-hmm. they feature a ton, you know, Kyle Shanahan with the 49ers, a ton of guys moving pre-snap. A lot of action, not only down the field, but across the field as well. Gives you more options, helps you get guys isolated, one-on-one, one-on-one matchups where they can take advantage of their athleticism, as well as uh, just makes it that much harder for the defense to key in on what the actual goal of this play is. So I love to hear they've added a lot more lateral movement to that because I feel like it was a missing dimension for us for a while. Uh, I think so. I think so. And then... Does it sound like there's been much subbing? There's a lot of rotation happening at all the positions. It sounds mm-hmm. like there's significantly less of the offensive line than other, every other spot, is what I was told. And so you just look at that starting O line, which I'm all for. I said this, I said this last year, like going in, every, it seems like every, every, whether spring or fall over the last few years, it's like, all right, mix them and match them until you find like whatever works. And it's like, well, at some point, at some point, you've got to iron it out and just get as many reps with those guys, the, the, the best five, and, and you jump in. I think they found their best five or six, mm-hmm. Lindsay, you know, w- w- pre-May transfer portal, and I think they're sticking with it. And so that's the same. And just for those who, who maybe missed the previous show or wants to hear the names again, at left tackle, that is Dylan Wade. At left guard, currently, that is um, Tate. Tate. No, Tam Suss is at right guard. Uh, Tate, I'm this. I'm forgetting Tate's last name. Tate Johnson at center. Avery Jones at right guard. Cam Stutz, Lindsey, and then at right tackle, Gunner Britton. That that's the starting five we're looking at right now. I fully expect Jeremiah Wright to be starting at left guard um, later, later when he's um, when he's ready. So that's that's kind of what I've been told, and I think that's what we're going to see every um, every viewing window that we get to see moving forward. Yeah, Auburn's in a little bit of a different position from a lot of typical years where it's like you have to figure out who the five best guys are. For the most part, you know, like you went out and you got three of these guys to transfer in this year because you knew you needed them to be starters. So this is a, we want them to spend as much time together as possible, build that chemistry. You're going to do things where you're in hostile environments and that guard is triggering the center on the silent count. You're going to do all kinds of stuff like that. You need these guys to be uh, together on the same page. I'm fine with them not rotating those guys, provided uh, you know you have the protections in place to not let a guy get hurt in spring. Uh, yeah, go I ahead, think, let them get I, all the time together. I think you're going to see Jeremiah Wright rotate in over the course of spring. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to see a Xavier Miller at some point. I don't know if you're going to see him as like rotate in as a right tackle, and you just kind of give him reps because he's the backup tackle. I believe if it currently goes chalk, and this is the fr- starting five you're looking at. Also, wouldn't be shocked to see some Connor Liu as well. They really like him. I mm-hmm. think he's going to be the guy after Avery, which is times out perfectly, honestly. Um, but you still may want to see him just in case something happens to Avery. Um, you know, you, you maybe maybe kind of put him, give him some reps with the ones just to kind of um, get his feet wet and see what he's capable of. But mm-hmm. that's kind of what I'm expecting on the offensive front. I'm not expecting a whole lot after this, which I think is great. And do what you need to do in spring, because in fall, you don't need to do that. I'm in the firm belief is like, find your guys, give them the reps over and over and over again, let them compete. And so it seems like that's what's happening. seems like that's what's happening. All right, Auburn baseball, by far their biggest challenge of the season so far, and they nailed it. And in fact, how far up they jumped in rankings, the rankings that actually matter, Lindsay, is pretty mind-blowing. We'll tell you what we mean in just a moment. Right here on Locked on Auburn. Today's show brought to you by our friends at Alumni Hall. Lindsay, everything that we're wearing right now is from Alumni Hall. This hat, this shirt, your shirt, mm-hmm. our pants, maybe. No, mine aren't there. But yes, all of this from Alumni Hall. We love putting our money where our mouth is. And Alumni Hall makes it very easy. I went in there Friday to pick out something 
Auburn baseball related because I knew I was going to the games this weekend. So I got an old school obby at bat on the back of this shirt. It's pretty cool. It's pretty great. My two year old loves it. Can't um, but but you 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 uh, you go to alumni hall all the time as well. Yes, I mean we have two young kids who are obviously growing tons. They're they're blowing through stuff, but they love mm-hmm. their obby merch. They love their Auburn stuff. We have family. I have a a, a nephew on the way. My sister is pregnant. We Huge. have sent a ton of Auburn stuff to to them to prepare them for that baby, especially because they live in Columbus, Ohio, middle of Ohio State territory. Right. Getting them all of this Auburn gear. Love Alumni Hall. The occasions where I can't make it or I need something to go to family somewhere else. Alumni Hall.com. Alumni Hall.com. Just go online wow. and it'll ship straight to them. I'm not paying extra for that. That's it's right. And, and, and look, they've got they've got three great stores. Auburn, Opelika, Huntsville, but Sometimes it's easy just to go on the website, alumnihall.com. Highly encourage you to do so as well. Lindsay, Auburn baseball, uh, dramatically so, swept the Lipscomb Bisons, and they did it really with um, in clutch fashion the last two uh, the last two games for sure, with kind of questionable spotty pitching. But I think whenever Auburn sweeps a team like this, it's really easy to say. Oh, well, it's Lipscomb. Lipscomb's not good. Lipscomb is good. Lipscomb's a good team. Lipscomb's a good team. Lipscomb was going into this series. Lipscomb was top 50 in the country in RPI. And that is, as much as Auburn fans have complained about the fact that Auburn baseball is not rated. Auburn baseball is not a top 25 team. RPI is the only thing that matters because that's what determines uh, seating, that's what figures out where you are. Lipscomb is a good team. They won the series to open the season against Notre Dame. Love it. They two games to one, they beat Notre Dame. Um, and it, it was it was behind their pitching. The max they had given up runs wise uh was I think eight runs mm. until this weekend in Auburn, and they lose seven to three on mm. Friday. They have a late lead on Saturday and lose it and lose 12 to 11 on a walk off. And then they lose on Sunday four to three. And in all three games, Auburn comes from behind to take the victory. And the big thing here, incredibly clutch hitting Bryson Ware has a home run in the eighth inning on both Saturday and Sunday that gives Auburn the lead. The Sunday one was predicted on the radio by Bruce Pearl. That's right. Super clutch. Uh, Ike Irish walks it off on Saturday with the base hit up the middle. True freshman he's goes out there. Second pitch he sees, back up the middle, base hit. They swarm him, rip the jersey off. It's a great time. Uh, and then at the end of this whole thing, you win these three games. Auburn goes up into the top 25 in RPI. They jumped 32 spots to number 23 Delicious. in RPI. Now, the re- again, the reason this is important, is because when it's time for the postseason and you're looking at who's going to host a regional, Mm -hmm. not every single time, but almost every single time, the best teams RPI-wise, the top 16, those are the hosting sites. Auburn was a top 10 team in RPI last year. There were teams that were better than them that were not a number one seed because Auburn's RPI was so incredibly high. We knew that the SEC schedule would help your RPI. Right. Uh, we scheduled some strategic out of conference matchups. Southeastern Louisiana coming up this weekend. They were a postseason team last year. They came to Auburn, Auburn. played them. Yeah. Auburn played them. They came to Auburn and Auburn beat the pants off of them. The in Cole game Foster. one. Right. The Cole Foster game hit home runs from both sides of the plate in the same inning. Delicious. But you have a home and home with Georgia Tech. You brought in Lipscomb. You brought in USC. You brought in Indiana with the idea of building up this RPI as good as possible to host and the fact that you were able to take some very good pitching from Lipscomb uh, and, and win all three games Lipscomb starter on, uh, on Sunday, that dude could be a starter at Auburn. He was shoving. He was fantastic. Yeah. That was the best pitcher that you will see until you get in conference play. And he might, because of injuries at Arkansas, he might be better than anybody you see at Arkansas. It might be until week two of conference play against Florida. When you see a better pitcher, uh, than this kid today, or Sunday. He was he, he was, was great. He yeah. was fantastic. I mean, Brandon Tucker goes like seven innings, uh, three hits, one run. As soon as he's out of the game, Auburn's bats come alive. Right. Uh, they rally. They get the late eighth inning home run from Bryson Ware again and win the series. So 
huge there. You've got two midweeks this week, a Tuesday home game against UAB. You bring back Casey Dunn. Um, he's going to be incredibly motivated to beat the pants off you because you passed him up like three times for your head coaching job. And then you go to Jacksonville State on Wednesday, bringing Auburn to another part of the state, letting other, mm-hmm. other schools, other areas of, of town come see their Tigers before you host Southeastern Louisiana this weekend. So uh, you did everything you had to do and some. I had, I had predicted on the Auburn Daily, I had predicted Auburn to go 2-1 and one this weekend. So the fact that they swept it was phenomenal. Yep, it's big. It's big. And, I mean, you mentioned this already, but like Ike Irish – is going by the time he's done at Auburn, he will be a special. I mean, he's going to be an all timer. I think. I, I think he's that good. Yeah, I mean, Ike Irish is like as of right now, he is on track to be probably SEC freshman of the year. I mean, he is batting five thirty five right now. He is batting. He is either batting number three or number four. Uh, for an SEC school. He is 23 of 43 right now. Um, he, well, has, he won He won SEC Freshman of the Week the first two weeks. He's two yeah. for two so far. That walk-off on Saturday may allow him to, uh, to win it the first three yeah. weeks of his career. His, uh, his, his batting average went down because he only went four for 10 this weekend. He has, like, he has... Um, he only had he has three strikeouts. He has eight walks and nine RBIs. He's batted in more runs than he's struck out. And as somebody who's watched those strikeouts, one of those, the one on Saturday, was not a strikeout. Oh. That was just some bad, some bad officiating, some bad umpiring. So Ike Irish is again, he's on track to be SEC freshman of the year. I mean, they cannot talk enough about how good of a batter's eye he is how mature he is. We've had a chance to get him now for media a few times. It sounds like you're talking to a, to a 26 year old MLB star. He understands hitting or case in hell. or case in hell. Same thing. Both 26. Right. Uh, understand things at, at such a deep level, as far as hitting really buys into that concept. I talk about a lot on locked MLB prospects about hitters are born, not made. He was born right. to be a hitter. Uh, and I, and you can see it by the fact that they're batting him third or fourth, on an SEC team that is uh, currently 9-1-1. One, and one. Lindsey Crosby, how can people find you, hear you, read you, love you, all that stuff? I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. My show, Locked at MLB Prospects, available for every podcast and on YouTube. You can find the writing, auburndaily.com. It's literally almost every single day I'm dropping new stuff there, guys. It's true. And it's true. Uh, the merch, aushirts.com. Yeah, you can find all my stuff at auburndaily.com as well. And we will see you tomorrow. This has been Locked on Auburn.